archetypes are really those things that are largely unconscious to us that play out over and over without our thinking about it and are kind of embedded in our psyche, just like they're embedded in, in your psyche or someone down the street. We're all kind of dealing with these things, even if we don't call them that, even if we don't recognize them as such. The work around most archetypes is for an individual is to recognize their role in your life to begin to acknowledge it, to begin to address it, so that it ceases to have such a great hold on you. Welcome to the Power Plant Body Podcast. My name is Taylor and this show is focused on self-development. I found in my own life, as well as the lives of my clients that I've worked with, that it's human nature to focus on goals in one area of life, or maybe two areas of life if you're lucky, to the detriment of the other areas of your life. For this reason, there's a tool that I use with my clients called the Goal Wheel that is specifically designed to shed light on how you might be preventing yourself from living the fullest life possible. In a nutshell, the Goal Wheel is a circle drawn on a piece of paper that's been divided into eight quadrants. The eight quadrants are family and friends, romance, fun and recreation, health and fitness, finances, personal growth and spirituality, career, and physical environment. Basically, you give yourself a score between one and 10 for each of these areas of your life, and that allows you to see where you're excelling and putting your attention, but it also shows you the areas of your life that you're currently neglecting. The areas of life that we neglect are often the areas that we need to work on the most, and that's exactly why I started this podcast, to share insights from teachers who are experts in one or more of these areas of the goal wheel. Each interview is meant to inspire you to take action in one of those areas so that you can live a more fulfilled and balanced life. To get your hands on a free copy of the Goal Wheel PDF so that you can use it to create meaningful goals and take steps to achieve them, head over to powerplantbody.com forward slash free dash tools. You'll find a bunch of other free tools and resources there as well. Now of all the podcasts that I could recommend to men interested in men's work and personal development, Lost Man Standing with Rainier Wilde probably tops my list. On paper, the reason why you should listen to what Rainier has to say is a long one. He was a college professor who taught ego psychology and human development. He was a former psychotherapist. He has a graduate degree in community counseling and an undergrad in human development. He's a certified vocational specialist, and he's a former spiritual director and pastor. But as Rainier would be the first to tell you, The titles a teacher has held and the credentials that he has on his wall mean very little if he hasn't also lived and learned through struggle and failure. Rainier has failed on numerous occasions in his life and he's very open about it. I believe that's one of the reasons that Rainier is able to communicate deep, meaningful wisdom so effortlessly to his listeners. He humanizes the complex inner workings of the human psyche and soul through personal stories of struggle and triumph. He intertwines these stories with ancient myth and recounting of human history, highlighting the fact that while the details change from man to man, the overarching stories and their effect remains largely unchanged. Storytelling is an art form, and it's been an integral part of human culture for as far back as we can look. However, that art form of communicating deeply ingrained cultural truths through story has largely been lost over the past hundred years or so. Rainier would say that you should listen to him because he's failed. I would say that you should listen to him for the same reason that I do, because he's able to take the lessons that he's learned from failure and craft them into meaningful stories that impact you at the level of your soul. And he does so with a lighthearted, warm, and almost childlike approach. When you listen to him, it feels as though he's speaking directly to you. Rainier is one of those rare people who is an expert in most of the quadrants of the Goal Wheel, and his podcast covers personal development, career, fun and recreation, family and friends, and physical environment. There's a lot that we covered in our conversation together, primarily focusing on personal development, but it's really only scratching the surface of what he has to share. So after you listen to our conversation, I encourage you to go listen to his podcast, Lost Man Standing. That's spelled L-O-S-T, Man Standing. And check him out on Instagram at Rainier Wild. That's at R-A-I-N-I-E-R-W-Y-L-D-E. Being a writer as well, Rainier's blog is also definitely worth checking out. That's www.rainierwild.com. I'll leave all of these in the show notes at powerplantbody.com forward slash Rainier dash wild. But for now, 
Without any further delay, I'm incredibly grateful to bring you my conversation with Rainier Wild. Well, Rainier, I appreciate you being on the podcast. I've been a huge uh, fan of your podcast, the Lost Man Standing podcast for quite some time. And mm. um, I was just saying just a second ago, I have so many questions and we don't have enough time for all of them. And I was thinking about the best way to open up this conversation. And, um, and, and what kept coming back to me was in your podcast, in the, in there, you have a couple quotes that um, are in the intro. And one in particular, <laughs> as soon as I heard it in the context of your podcast, which is on men's work, it hit me like a sack of bricks. And it's uh, Morpheus, he says, from, from the Matrix, the original Matrix, he says, uh, you're here because you know something. What you know, you can't explain but you feel it, you felt it all, or you felt it your entire life. And when I heard that, I thought, since I've been 14, I've felt that. And it's only gotten stronger. All the men I have in my life who are involved in men's work or men's circles, they feel that too. So what is that? What, what is inside of us that's calling us? We know it's powerful, but we, don't, we can't quite wrap our mind around what it is. You know, I'd love to say that this is a cultural moment, and I think that that is part of it. I think that most men since the 80s, the 1980s, who were raised in the aftermath of some of those early culture wars, certainly grew up in a world that was profoundly disorienting. And I think most men since the 1980s were raised in a way to either be the nice guy, as you often hear, or what I term the vampire, or sort of the macho jerk, the werewolf, uh, to use two kind of mythological archetypes. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that most of the men I encounter were sort of raised to be that kind of vampiric soft man who's very tender, very doting, very kind composed, civilized, regal, but underneath those layers, they're depleting the resources of the culture at large, of their friends, of their family, certainly of their, their, their partners, and of the feminine uh, source itself. That's a cultural moment. But I think that quote by Morpheus and, and really uh, the larger picture here is that for, for eons, I think going all the way back to, to the foundations of civilization eight to 10,000 years ago, there's been something profoundly troubling about our existence. There's been something off, right? A longing that we can't quite describe, a, a, a sense of being out of place, a, a sense of being locked out of our home. You know, and I think if most of us were were telling the truth, we would kind of admit to that. We would kind of say there's a dis-ease, right? And of course, today we feel it all the more. Like you and I are both sitting right now, and isn't sitting mm. wonderful? And isn't sitting? Well, I think you're sitting. You might not be. Yeah, uh, I'm sitting. <laughs> <laughs> but but isn't sitting wonderful? And isn't sitting mm. a great luxury? And don't we have these wonderful chairs and cushions mm. and pads that we can do so? But of course, the human body really wasn't made for that, was it? And so we've yeah. we've scrunched our bodies into these tight little angles and these corners. We've shoved our faces full of plastic food, of things that are barely even edible. And then we wonder why we're sick. We wonder why we're depressed. We wonder why we're disoriented. But of course, the real marvel is not that. The real marvel is that we could survive and flourish anyway, doing these <laughs> terribly unreal things. Mm -hmm. but, but that's the body. Think of the human soul. The human soul has been scrunched and caged and sifted through and put in these neat little boxes, these confines of religion and the state and now corporatism, consumerism. And we've been told what to be and how to be. And for most of us, by the time we get to, to the age of 30 or 40, we're so inundated, we're so cut down, we're so eroded that we barely even have a sense of self. We're not vampires or werewolves at all anymore. We're just zombies, right? Mm -hmm. Following the herd. We're just consuming, mm -hmm. going to the next fix, trying to get through. And that's how I've certainly encountered much of my life. That's how so many of the men I talk to encounter their life. And that quote by Morpheus says it all, right? There's an inner 
knowing. And it's, it's not just the last 40 years. It's probably the last 8,000 years mm-hmm. calling us to wake up. Man, there was so much in that. Uh, I, I picked out a few things that really resonated with, with me, the, that nice guy, you mentioned the nice guy. And, and that was a big um, eye opener for me when I first found out about this concept of the nice guy and your, you, you call it the, the, um, the vampire, which I think is really important because when, if people haven't heard of that nice guy concept, um, you know, what's wrong with being a nice guy? But underlying that, the vampirical nature of it, the, and, and you, you, you talked about it, which is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it causes havoc in the world around the nice guy. So, so, and there's a segue into there because you mentioned um, being a zombie, like it's kind of morphed into being a zombie at this stage. So, which I haven't, it makes sense, but I, ha- I haven't heard that before. So, when if someone's never heard of this nice guy syndrome or the vampirical nature of it, how would you describe what that is and how it shows up in the world today? Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, and I think it probably deserves a little unpacking, as mm-hmm. you kind of are noting here. You know, in traditional cultures, so we're talking about the human species has been around as our species for about 350,000 years. And we've only been civilized, so to speak, (laughs) for about the last 8,000 years. So a very small percentage of time. Before that, everyone was blissfully uncivilized. And we call those traditional cultures. And today there's a few traditional cultures that still exist, largely untapped or unfettered by by the, the the constructs that we call civilization. And when we observe those cultures, we kind of get a window into perhaps what, what humanity looked like before we took this deep dive into the, the project that we're now all kind of living with, Mm -hmm. uh, which has some great advantages like the microwave and the flat TV, uh, but also has, and chairs, but also (laughs) has some real disadvantages in general (laughs) as well. Um, but, but when we look at those traditional cultures, one of the very interesting things we see, especially attached to males, is a process called initiation. Mm-hmm. And initiation for males was seen in traditional cultures to be absolutely imperative. Females have built into their bodies an inward death observance, right? Right somewhere between the age of nine to 12 years old, there's something that dies in a female's body. She feels it and then she sees it. She begins Mm -hmm. to live with the reality of death in her Mm -hmm. life. She has a limited number of eggs inside of her and so begins to cope with the reality that her duration, her timeline is in fact limited. Males have almost no such internal clock. And traditional cultures understood something, that for the male to truly flourish, an external death experience would have to occur that would Mm -hmm. mimic and mirror the internal one that females went through around the same age. So traditional cultures created what we now understand to be initiatory practices, where a male was forced to confront his own mortality. To confront death, to to acknowledge it. And often this would look like being plunged into near-death experiences. I think of one fairly recent indigenous culture, although we don't really think of them as indigenous, but that would be the Norse or the Vikings. And and they they date to around 1300. And they did this very interesting thing. They would string up, they would literally hang a young boy around the age of nine. The men would grab the boy, they would hang him until he asphyxiated, until he wow. he literally passed out. He thought he was dying, <laughs> then they'd cut him down. I mean, that that's kind of what we're talking about. I could name any number of these sort of rituals. And all this is very interesting, except to say that we can extract in that that first initiation that would happen a confrontation of mortality, but second, they would be extracted from the soft world of the feminine. Mm. Up to that, up to that point, a boy was profoundly enmeshed in the mother or the container that resembled the mother, the village. Suddenly they were whisked away and plunged into the cold and icy and hard realities of life. 
They would have to, to fend for themselves. They would have to develop their sufficient strength. They would have to, to learn how to take a hit and give a hit. They would learn how to master the struggles of aggression of assertiveness, of activeness. They would have to focus and hone their, their uh, energies to, to simply survive. They had mm-hmm. to learn that the world was hard and that they could be hard too. And those mm-hmm. were some of the first uh, real lessons of initiation. You had to be cut away from the soft world of the feminine and you had to literally, in a, in a way, die. So perhaps more or less actually figuratively die, but most of them thought they were dying. Now, here's why I say, if in that culture, a boy did not make it through that, if he tapped out, or maybe he, he disappears, or maybe he never went through it, but he failed somehow. This was a, a great lack of trust now. He wasn't trustable. The tribe couldn't trust him. They couldn't entrust Mm -hmm. their leadership or their assertiveness or their protection to him because he hadn't, in fact, confronted his own death. Now, Mm -hmm. here's why I bring this up. They began to talk about these men in very archetypal ways. They created all kinds of stories about them, stories that we now inherit as myth. One of those stories, a boy who doesn't die. A boy who chooses his own mortality, who chooses the feminine path or the path of softness, not embracing his own aggression, assertiveness, and activeness, they called them vampires. And they told all Mm. kinds of stories about vampires, these creatures who refused to die, these creatures who prolonged their own life, these creatures who passed through civilization, who took on soft guises, who were more like the feminine than they were of embracing the masculine principle. And so they called those vampires. Conversely, there was, of course, the werewolf, people who who actually also did not confront their own mortality, people who were too attached to their own nature. And so they became ravenous. And that's really the flip side of of when you refuse to confront your own mortality, when you choose to extend, so to speak, your life and not confront the hardness of life, you either take on the characteristics of softness and really like kind of a pretender, or you become uh, overly dominating, overly domineering, overly aggressive towards the feminine. And isn't it interesting that both vampires and werewolves, their relationship to, to coming out, so to speak, is in connection to the archetypal symbols of the feminine. The vampire becomes the vampire at night, right? Mm, which is, which is right. of course, like the feminine characteristic and the werewolf becomes a werewolf at the full moon. Right. And so both of these are deeply in connection, the masculine to the feminine. And what happens when you're dealing with a man who hasn't, in fact, taken on the hardness of life. Mm. And with your description of these rites of passage with men, it sounds like, um, and and going back to the idea of, of, um, being taken away from the feminine, that's the protective nature of the mother, as I understand it, uh, without being removed from that, the feminine, um, protection or the, the mother's protection, the mother's sustenance, uh, the, the man never learns to be self-generative and contribute back to the, to the tribe and contribute his masculine energy in a generative way. Um, what, where do you find, um, in where we are today with this, uh, you know, I imagine there's a lot of uh, vampires or a lot of werewolves showing up in, in modern day life today. How does that affect, um, our society? How does that affect the way that we live life today? Well, you look at culture today in relationship to the structure I just kind of laid out. The reality is we live in, if we're talking about Western civilization, You can really begin to trace um, the rise of vampiric cultures to Alexander the Great. Now, this is a very strange uh, thread. I've never really talked about this publicly. Um, But if you look sociologically at the development of cultures and societies, we begin to trace this young man, this young man with this very golden affect And the society that is created around him, 
It was created around a young man who is undetached from his mother. And you look at some of those very interesting correlations between him and his mother, and they're fascinating. But we begin to see the rise of civilizations that present as peacemakers, present as caregivers. And you think of, of, of course, like I live in the United States and, and you think of how the United States presents itself to the world. I don't know if there was ever a war that the United States went into where it didn't mass market itself as the great hero of, mm. of all these things. Well, why? What's the pretext there? These are vampiric cultures presenting that they are the sole arbiter of truth and justice and liberty and civilization. Right. And and of course, vampires hate werewolves. So the United States of vampiric society is is, of course, wanting to snuff out all of these barbaric, ravenous, horrible, greedy werewolf like civilizations. And there's this battle that happens between cultures. In fact, that's really where these large stories take place. So if we talk about culture today and its impact We live in a society that is not only producing vampires and filled with vampires, but largely is vampiric itself all the way to the top, presenting as one thing all the while in a in a extraction game, draining the life out of everything it comes in contact with. And Mm -hmm. so these principles can be applied when you don't confront your own shadows, when you don't confront your own um, desires, your own darkness, your own ability to to unleash havoc, your own lack of, quote, goodness, when you don't confront those things, and by confront, I mean acknowledge them and then integrate them, what begins to happen is you take on a mask, Mm. you take on a false self, and that gives you the permission to drain, to deplete. Yeah. That I, I wanted to ask you about this later, but uh, it's come up now, which is the idea of these masks. Um, I know for myself and I know for a lot of my friends who have spoken at length about uh, this particular thing, we're different people in front of different people. So in front of our family, in front of our friends, in front of our, in front of our school uh, mates, we're diff- we take on different personas. And I, I remember hearing you say once that... Um, Oh, how, how did you put it? You said personalities are defense mechanisms. Um, if I'm getting that right against, against the world or no, not against the world. I shouldn't put it that way. But, um, when I, when I thought about my personality before that, I can, you know, I can think about masks as defense mechanisms, but when I think about personality, I'm like, no, that's my, that's who I am. But when I heard you talk about personality and how it, it, it's your way of, um, protecting what's underneath in some way, shape or form, these various uh, encounters that you have throughout life. Um, How does, how does that come up? How how do we, how do we use these masks, these these different uh, personalities that we have to protect ourselves? And, and what you spoke about earlier, the shadow, if you don't confront the shadow, if you don't bring it to uh, bring light to it, um, what happens if, uh, if those, you know, if these masks that we use um, to, to protect ourselves get in the way of that work? Well, I think that uh, here again, probably we could define some terms. You know, when I talk about the shadow, I'm really meaning that which lies beneath <laughs> mm. and uh, the, the un, largely unconscious self. So if we think of how these things are formed, I like to use an analogy. I talk about it quite a bit of a clear glass lake, a, a pristine and beautiful lake in the mountains, perhaps teeming with life, filled with all kinds of creatures, flora and fauna. And then the cold wind blows, right? Those mountains get Mm -hmm. cold, the winter sets in. And what forms on top of that lake is an icy layer. That Mm. icy layer, maybe we don't think of it this way, but really is a protective mechanism for the lake itself, for that body of water. But it's also a preventative mechanism, very hard for that for that little fish now to jump out on any given day. It has to, you know, gnaw its way through the ice or better yet, a fisherman will do the, mm-hmm. the gnawing for it and create a hole in the ice. If, if we think about this very simple analogy, that's really personality formation. 
We start mm-hmm. off as almost limitless potential, flowing, dynamic, moving, responding to the, the situations in life. And then what happens, we very quickly encounter disappointments. We very quickly encounter frustrations or resistance mm-hmm. points. And quite naturally, we create an uppermost layer of ice. And there's multiple layers of ice, of course, as the cold winds blow, we develop multiple layers and structures. But but even the initial layer is a protective layering to try and keep ourselves safe, to try and prevent mm-hmm. any more harm or damage. That's really the human persona, mm. right? And even that word persona, which is the Greek word for mask, kind of says it all. The persona, the ego, the personality is really that topmost layer of self that was developed first to protect mm-hmm. and then later becomes a powerful preventative, right? And how is it preventative? Well, it's awfully hard to respond to life. If you're crystallized, if you're Mm -hmm. stuck, if you think that this is who I am, and of course, identity works like that. It it, it puts our stake in the ground. It nails our foot to the floor. And we say, this is who I am. And so you're in an argument and they're 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 verbally abusing you. They're 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 trampling on you and you want to talk back. You want to speak in response or in defense, but you can't. You can't. Why? Because that's not who I am. I don't do those kinds of things. What do you mean? Aren't you a human? Because I know that humans have a lot of responses. Mm -hmm. Well, not this human. Where did you learn that? Where did you learn not to respond that way? Well, I guess it happened when, (laughs) and you get the idea. Mm -hmm. And so that's really how it works. We lose our capacity to be effective in life in direct correlation to these personas that we develop up top, which are really a crystallization of our potential and Mm. saying, this is who I am. This is what I am. This is how I respond. And of course, those, those crystallizations, those concrete selves actually are kind of nice. Relationally speaking, we know that we can trust one another. You know, we know that we can engage one another based on how consistent you are, right? If you, if you Mm -hmm. were different every day, like Mm -hmm. I I, I would go, my God, Taylor's inconsistent, (laughs) right? I can't trust him. I shouldn't be in relationship Mm -hmm. to him. Mm -hmm. Right. And so actually most, most, uh, discourse, most connection really happens at an ego level. That ice is Mm -hmm. where other people set their foot down upon. So if you think about it that way, most of us are just defense mechanisms encountering other defense mechanisms. Yeah. Mm. Very rarely do we Mm. get down to what lies beneath. Man, that's profound. The idea that we're defense mechanisms meeting other defense mechanisms uh, that then begs the question, how do we, how do we interact on that deeper level? How do I, first of all, how do I know my deeper level personally? Because if I don't know who and what that is, then I could never have a conversation with someone else's version of whatever that deeper level is. Um, how do we begin to break through, you know, that top layer of ice or, or do we, is that even something that we want to do break through that top layer of ice to get to what's underneath? I think that here again, it's probably useful to talk analogously. So I'll try it in a couple Mm -hmm. of different ways. For the most part, by the time we get into our um, forties, shall we say, Mm -hmm. as men, um, something becomes clear. It's almost like a a snowball started rolling up a mountain and Mm -hmm. things begin to pile onto it. Right. So it's like, we're, we're our conditioning and we're our circumstances and we're our choices and we're the consequences of our choices and the consequences of other people's choices and our genetic coding and so on and so forth until by the bottom of the hill, it's, it's just a giant avalanche of, of scriptedness, of fadedness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's remarkable that we can make a choice at all. And so it, it, it really is in a sense like that, that, Ice is so dense, is so impenetrable, we feel so scripted and so stuck that we hardly know who we are. 
We hard, mm-hmm. we feel, as we said earlier, much like zombies, and mm-hmm. we're we're simply frozen, incalcified in life. What happens around the the middle life transition is that some cracks begin to form in that ice, mm-hmm. and it, it it looks like losing a job, it looks like losing a reputation, it looks like losing a marriage. It looks like mm-hmm. falling in love with the wrong person. It looks like moving unexpectedly. It looks like society coming apart at the, at the seams. The cracks begin to form. We begin to lose the rigidity of control that we imagined we had. And suddenly what bubbles up is this dark water underneath. Mm-hmm. And we get real scared. And that's when we go to therapists or ministers or gurus or teachers. And, and basically, we beg them, fix me. Patch the ice back up. Please give me, my, mm-hmm. give me my spouse back. Give me my car back. Give me my job back. Anything to make me feel fixed again. Give me the answers. Mm-hmm. Give me the solutions. I want to feel strong again. And I felt strong when I felt safe. And I felt safe when I felt solid. But the real healing work is actually to pry the, those cracks open all the more. And of course, if you've ever seen ice cut up, what begins to happen is that ice is pried apart. When that logger jam is, is opened up. The ice begins to dissolve. Mm. That's really what you want to have happen. You don't want to extract the ice. Like no one's goal should be to rip away the persona. Because again, the persona is also part of your potential. It's part of your Mm. essence. It's part of who you are. It's just incalcified. It's just crusted up. It's frozen. And so what we want to do is dissolve it back so that it can flow again, so that you can respond, so that when you get in that argument, you don't camp out on, well, this is who I am. Instead, you can do what's effective. You can say what you Mm. need to in the moment. And where we want to get to ultimately is flowing water. We really want to get to the place where we can move and respond to the currents of life to meet uh, the edges of life as it is seamlessly and not be frozen. And is that, is that work with the, as you say, the, the dark water coming up through the cracks and it scares a lot of people away but the people who decide to go forward with it and pry the ice open and, and let it flow up and, and, uh, and get back to a state of, I, I guess, um, integration between the two layers. Is that shadow work that you're talking about? Is that the shadow that lies underneath that we're talking about? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding around what we call the shadow mm-hmm. and certainly what we call the work. Um, In truth, the process I just described is what I understand to be shadow work. Shadows are all of the things that we've cut away, that we've eliminated, that we've detached ourselves from in order to belong, in order to fit in, in order to feel safe. Mm. So all of those things fall underground. They, They go to the bottom, right? And we cover it over with all of the things that that look good, that help us win, mm. that seem justified, that, that help us maintain control and avoid being controlled. All these things to, to create the illusion of stability and safety. So when most people come in for, for something like shadow work, when most people inquire of me and they say, oh, oh, Rainier, God, my shadow, it's really wreaking havoc. I need to, to get a handle on it. What they don't know is inevitably my thought is, no, what we need to get a handle on is your persona. Mm. <laughs> what we need to get a handle on is that egoic part of yourself that is creating a shadow in the first place. Mm-hmm. It's the things that are casting the shadow that are the problem. The shadow is actually just a, a guide or a reminder saying, hey, look at me. Look at me. There's more going on than meets the eye. You're not really mm-hmm. seeing yourself. You think you're in control. You're not. And I'm going to remind you. And of course, the more we're addicted or hold on to, to the idea of being in control, the larger the shadows get, right? The, the, mm-hmm. the bigger the object, so to speak, the larger the shadows have to become. Why? Because they're a gift. 
They're trying to say, look at me, there's something here. There's something you're not seeing, something you're not acknowledging. So real shadow work is getting inside and beginning to say, what's going on? What's this trying to tell you? What's this guest trying to bring into your life? And how will you acknowledge it? How will you integrate it? Yeah. And it sounds uh, for everybody listening, I'm sure it sounds just as scary as it sounds to me, which is, you know, the looking at these parts of you, like you say, it starts to peek its head through the ice. It's so easy to, well, I shouldn't say it's easy, but uh, it seems easier to look away, to just pretend everything's okay, that there aren't cracks in the ice rather than, uh, you know, plunge into the depths and see the gifts that it's offering you, like you say. The, you mentioned... Um, a little while back and, and my limited understanding of this is that uh, it can start to manifest through what are called archetypes, but I'm not sure I fully understand what archetypes are. And I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people don't as well. How would you describe archetypes as they relate to this? And um, what are their roles with this whole process of, of uh, you know, integration? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think every culture has its own set of symbols, its own sets of stories that are unique to its own culture. And what anthropologists and early psychologists discovered is that there are some symbols, there are some stories that are so deeply embedded into human psyche that mm -hmm. they're pan-cultural. They, they, they run across multiple lines of development. For instance, the mother is a powerful archetype right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're a Botswanan hunter or you're a Wall Street broker, the mother simply speaks. We kind of have an embedded understanding of what that means. When you look at fairy tales, right, you see the mother really plays a huge role within that. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, we, we understand um, a villain kind of communicates something. A sage kind of communicates something. We, we would say that there are multiple archetypes, the masculine, the feminine. These are two very great or strong archetypes, the shadow, the larger the archetype, meaning the more things kind of get packed into it, the more it's a complex mm. structure like the masculine, for instance, which a lot of things get dumped into or the feminine. A lot of things go into that. The shadow quite a bit there, mm -hmm. the larger its role in our life and, and, and the more often we're kind of controlled by it. Mm -hmm. Archetypes are really those things that are largely unconscious to us that play out over and over without our thinking about it and are kind of embedded in our psyche, just like they're embedded in, in your psyche or someone down the mm -hmm. street. We're all kind of dealing with these things, even if we don't call them that, even if we don't recognize them as such. Uh, what the, the work around most archetypes is for an individual is to recognize their role in your life, to begin to acknowledge it, to begin to address it so that it ceases to have such a great hold on you. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when we talk about things like the shadow, well, the shadow may very well have some regressive tendencies, right? I'm not, I'm not suggesting that something like the things buried in your unconscious couldn't very well hurt you. Uh, think, for instance, of that movie, The Man in the Iron Mask. It was a book long mm. before it was a movie by Alexander Dumas. And it's an interesting story. And it's an interesting story, not because it was written somewhere sometime by someone. It's an interesting story because it happens. Like, it's a story that happens over and over. And so in this particular story, there are twin boys who are born and mm -hmm. they're, they're identical twins, and they're born as the heir to the French throne. And of course, the French aristocracy knows, well, this could be horrible. We have to pick one. One of them mm -hmm. has to become the king. And so he is then groomed to be king and kingly and great, and he takes on the outer dimensions. Okay, that's the persona. The other is quite unceremoniously shuffled off into the basement, <laughs> mm. into a dungeon. And an, a mask is even put on his face so people can't even recognize him as the king. They're not the same. They're different in the minds of everyone. 
because a mask has now been put on him. And there in the dungeon, he grows gangly and bearded and long haired, you know, real monstrous. Right. Mm. <laughs> and, and he, <laughs> he grows out of control. His, his nails grow long and, and he takes on the look of, of truly someone astonishing, terrifying. Mm. So that one day when he gets out of the dungeon, people are shocked. Who is this man? He's horrifying to look at. And so the very next move, of course, and I won't, I won't tell the whole story here, but, but I think the next movement is fascinating. They quickly groom up the guy from the dungeon. <laughs> they quickly make mm. sure that he looks good, right? Because, mm. of course, that's, that's always what we want to do. As soon as the shadow gets out, we're horrified by it. We go, oh, dear God, mm. how did that ever get there? And we quickly shove it back down into the dungeon, make sure that no one sees it, or we clean it up, we make it look good uh, in order to present. That's usually how it works. And what a beautiful story, right? And we all kind of have yeah. uh, twins ruling our life, one underground in the dungeon who's taking on mm-hmm. these, these underdeveloped and, and unseemly characteristics, and one up front who's, who's looking good and golden and shiny. So again, what I want to say is, of course, in the dungeons of our life, undeveloped, ungroomed, undealt with, these things become monstrous and really can hurt us when they get out. What we need to do is begin to interact with them. We need to begin to work with them and talk with them and engage with them, sit with them a while and say, tell me about your life. Tell me about what's happened. And then we get to make choices like, do we want to let this man out into the castles of our life? (laughs) Maybe we don't. Maybe we want to to say, thanks, there's another kingdom somewhere else that would gladly receive you. Uh, This (laughs) isn't it. (laughs) Um, But for many of us, we can actually take those things and we can begin to work with them and, and, and create a place for them in our life. That's how archetypes work right there. Yeah. You know, and, and the thing I love about that, uh, the thing I love about how you described archetypes is you use a story, which is, it seems like that's the only way we can talk about these things is there's no, um, like you can't, there's no ones and zeros that this is, this is like, you have to experience and understand it on a, on an emotional, um, level through storytelling or through, uh, you know, metaphor. Um, mm-hmm. and there's another there's another story that, you know, many people are familiar with, uh, which is Iron John, which is very, has a very similar Mm. uh, motif to it, right? With the wild man being locked in a, in a cage in the center of the kingdom and, um, you know, the integration Mm. between the, the young boy and the, and the, uh, and the wild man within that's, Mm. um, yeah, I love, I love that. That's, that's fantastic. So, so these archetypes, there's, as you say, there, there's levels all the way down and, and different cultures have different archetypes and it sounds like the 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 at the apex of this thing is the masculine and the feminine and the more um all inclusive they become the the more uh the more they encapsulate the more nuanced they are um when someone does choose to do this work with someone like yourself right because you you this is something that you do with your clients you help them uh do shadow work you help them do rites of passage um you also have um uh, uh, like, uh, men's gatherings, um, and, and do men's work. How is the approach different with everybody? Is it, do you follow, uh, do you, are there certain ar- archetypes that you look for in, in someone to help them express it? How does that show up for you and, and your clients generally? Mm. You know, I increasingly don't see people as uh, clients. I increasingly don't really even see the work that I do so much as something like that um, medical model that that we received. I certainly am not a practicing therapist by any means, mm-hmm. uh, though I received that training. And I don't even view myself as a coach. These days, I see myself really as a teacher. And, mm-hmm. and so the, the work that I do with people takes on the characteristic of teaching. And Mm. part of the underlying foundations of this is that I believe that the truth will set you free. And so if we can create openings, create teaching moments, right. Mm. In the, in the clearings of our life, 
it's like an aha goes off where someone may have spent a lifetime sort of searching for this moment. But when it happens, when transformation happens, it really happens in the twinkling of an eye. Right. Even mm-hmm. if it's taken all these years to get there, I sort of think about that, that, you know, like when um, ambassadors get together or presidents of uh, leaders of foreign nations get together and all the cameras go off and they sign the treaty, they sign the accord. <laughs> and, you know, it's like they get all the press for it. But but really yeah. what's been happening is for like the last 20 years, they've had guys working on this and, and, and powerful women mm. and men who are who are developing this and, and, and just like the cameras go off in the moment. Um, that's mm. really so much of how the work actually looks. It's like mm-hmm. the truth really sets you free and the truth comes out and trickles. So when you say, and I love that you said this, like, is it different for everyone? Well, yes. Right. It's not only different for everyone. It's also different moment to moment. Right. Mm. Not everyone's need is the same. And that outer mask, the persona, which has such a mechanical quality to it, such a, Mm. an incredible automated quality is so, um, wired to not only defend you, but eventually to defend it, that it will do oh, wow. just about anything, just about anything to sneak out and to make sure that it survives. And that means it will take on a lot of characteristics. It will blame. It will it will make excuses. Let's just take uh, you, you reference the, the men's work that I do. I, I lead a, a quarterly men's transformational circle called The Rope. And of course, it's all based on the idea that we need transformation. And so, you know, you have a lot of guys from a lot of places all over the world come in and they want to be transformed. And what are they acknowledging? They're acknowledging right from the get go that something in their life isn't working. Like nobody's there Mm -hmm. because they're the wise man. (laughs) Right. Like they're saying, like, God, something in my life isn't working. I need. Mm -hmm. But, you know, boy, you push just a little bit and you get a, a sharp yelp that sounds something like this. Hey. What I'm doing (laughs) looks great. It's working. Don't dare change me. Now, isn't that goofy? That's so goofy that we would come into something and and we would say, I really need help. And then as soon as you get pushed, you go, hey, I don't need help. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's like, well, Mm -hmm. well, that's a that's a real asshole move. And I don't mean they're assholes. What I actually mean is that that it layer, that unconscious, incalcified, automated, mechanistic, scripted layer that isn't even human, it's robotic Mm -hmm. at a certain point, is simply so self-absorbed and so um, armed against being changed that it will do just about anything to get out of the limelight. And mm-hmm. even if you said, I want help, it will quickly divert. Yeah. That reminds me of uh, the first time I heard you talk about um, your embodied men's retreat. And uh, mm. you said, I remember hearing you say something to the effect of um, one of the primary reasons why you, you believe it to be as successful as it is at helping people um, through the, the, through men go through this catharsis is that 70% of it is, is, uh, physical in nature, it, like getting men to move their bodies, to, to allow energy to, to flow, if I'm understanding it right. And uh, what that reminded me of, it was, uh, this was a couple of years ago, um, our men's, the men's group that I'm a part of, um, all of the squads got together and we got, went down to the beach and there was, you know, 150 of us or something. And uh, we had a bonfire in the middle and the um, the idea was that to we, we all, all of our squads, we have uh, different animals that we, you know, we're representative of our squad and we were meant to essentially just l- let that animal um, express itself through our body in just the most wild, chaotic, cathartic way you could possibly imagine around this bonfire. And uh, that thin veneer of um, that calcified layer that you're talking about of the guy who's like, yeah, no, uh, we don't need to do this. That was me <laughs> because, you know, 98% of the men who had, and were, were there um, just went with it and allowed themselves to express themselves authentically in the moment as the animal um, without any, without that hindrance from that calcified layer that you talked about. For me, wow. I took a step back and there were a couple other guys too that did this and I rationalized to myself that I, I didn't need this 
because this, like I, I looked around and said, man, these guys are drinking the Kool-Aid. And then years later, having more, you know, speaking with and listening to people like yourself and, and others who, who understand why this is important, I can look back and say, that was a medicine that I needed so badly at that moment. And that calcified layer um, challenged it and, and won and prevented me from, from, uh, from taking it. Yeah. It's not interesting that we have these things that, that we really want to do. We really want to step mm -hmm. in. I, I, I think of a, uh, of a moment in my life when I was with my kids and um, my second oldest son, um, he got it in his mind that he wanted to dive off an incredibly high uh, like bridge like 75 mm. feet above the water. And a lot oh of people were doing this. <laughs> right. Right. So I, I should say it was, it was, it was at this wonderful natural reserve and it was a yeah. very deep glacial pool at the bottom. And yeah. lots of people were doing this. It wasn't as unsafe as all that, but, but honestly, like looking at it from afar, it really looked pretty terrifying and, and it had some real danger life. attached to it. <laughs> right. Mm. And so I, I kind of, uh, you know, buckled a little. I said, well, I don't know, bud. I mean, I, you know, you're a good swimmer. You're a good diver. I'm just not sure if this is the move. And so my mm -hmm. oldest son and I kind of wandered away and, and we, we went looking for things. And when I came back, I hear this loud yodel from up above my, my second oldest son. And, uh, mm -hmm. he's up at the top and he jumps in <laughs> and, it, 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 and, and like makes it, it comes out. He's like super excited. I'm astonished. And I, yeah. I asked him, I said, what happened? And he says, well, dad, in the last two hours, I worked my way up to it. Cause there had been a number of bridges kind of at varying heights. And he had mm. finally overcome all of his fears and worked his way up to the top. And he said, dad, it's amazing. I really want you to do this with me. And so in that moment, as a father, I felt really like I wanted to have this experience with my son. Mm -hmm. And I was so proud of him, actually. I wasn't even mad. I was like, geez, mm -hmm. like you, you, you were smart. You, you took it in reasonable ways. And I said, well, where'd you start? And he points to this one bridge, 25 <laughs> feet above the water. And I go, okay, mm -hmm. let's go up. Now, I got to be honest. My persona mask does not like heights, like by any mm -hmm. means. So we get about <laughs> 25 feet above the water and I'm like looking over the edge and, and I get woozy, you know, I'm just like, Oh gosh, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> and so I sit down and he sits down beside me. We spend the next hour up there on that bridge and I do everything I can to try and think my way into jumping off. Right. And then he tries to talk me into jumping off. And then he tries about everything he knows, he tries all these great parenting tactics that I've tried to use on him, you know, like, Hey dad, afterwards we can go out for like a Slurpee. What do you say about to that? You know, he's like, he's rewarding me. He's doing all these things. <laughs> Bottom line, after about an hour, I look at him and I say, bud, I just, I don't think I can do this with you. Mm. And I, I leave and I look back and I think, God, how sad. What a sad moment that is to look back and go, I missed this experience. I missed this experience with my son. I missed this experience for myself because, well, I was afraid. Okay, that's one thing. But actually, because there was a part of me that was so encalcified, so ingrained, and I had bought into the idea that that same part was the part that could rescue me. Listen, the part mm. that's the problem isn't going to rescue you. <laughs> Our mm -hmm. thinking mind is never going to actually think us into a different state of being, right? The only thing that would have trained me to do something different was actually just to do it, mm. just to do it. And we think that we can put ourselves in situations where we can think our way into a new kind of living. You really can't, but you can live your way into a new kind of thinking. The reverse is true. I was hoping you were going to say that because that's a quote I remember you saying from a few of your episodes back on your podcast. And I remember hearing that and thinking, you know, we all have those experiences um, where that calcified layer prevented us from doing something that in hindsight would have, it could have been a doorway to a, to a whole world of growth for us and experience. And mm. uh, I remember when you said that you can't think your way to a new way of living or you can't think yourself to a new way of living, but you can live yourself to a new way of thinking. 
uh, that's incredibly profound. And, um, you know, that's a quote that I'll, I'll do my best to live by from here on out, you know? Wow. So me too, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> when you were talking about your son just now, um, and how he, you know, he ascended different levels and went to the, to the, to the top bridge there, I couldn't help, but, uh, think about the, um, what we, what we started speaking about at the, at the start of this, which is rites of passage. And, mm. uh, I don't know how old your son was at the time. Um, you said it, you're, he's your second 12. oldest son. Yeah, he was 12. Yeah. He was 12 then. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I remember that there's, a, a you know, Robert Bly talks about this. He said that I think there's a section in, in, um, Iron John when he talks about how, uh, you know, in, in a men's gathering, they had men put uh, red bands around all the marks on their body that they had got as children, you know, scars and whatnot. And the whole room, everybody was just covered in these in, in uh, their bands from scars they got in its adolescence. And there's this like drive to um, to prove ourselves, drive to like confront danger, to confront, um, you know, death, I guess, is, is what it comes down to. And d- is that is that our yearning, our need to like that feeling, like as Morpheus said, you felt it your whole life. Is that our need to pull out of the feminine, to pull away from the mother, to find ourselves as men and, and come back and, and be generative? Is that where that comes from? I think so. I think most of the, the mythology that I've read have, have included powerful uh, storying around the creation of the universe in which a male God cuts away from the female chaos. Mm. And, Mm -hmm. and I I realize that's probably a a loaded concept for a lot of different theorists, particularly feminine (laughs) theorists. Um, but, but I think if we appreciate it perhaps mythologically, it is describing Mm. something. I mean, I mean the male part of the, the reproductive, uh, organism there splits away from the female the Mm. the the boy child feels the innate need to come out of the of the womb and separate himself eventually over the next 12 years from the mother i mean on and on the the great task is actually the masculine at first has to pull away from the feminine that that's really that's really how that story begins And it's an important story because they're not the same. Because when we're dealing with these archetypes of the masculine and the feminine, these powerful modes of being, we're really dealing with with two spiritual journeys that are different and distinct and unique in themselves, but are also intertwining, that are sort of like a double helix spiraling around one another and then coming together again at the very end. Mm. And that's, that's really... Um, part of this whole thing, the masculine has to come away from. And for about, you know, 80% of males, I think, uh, from the literatures I've read, they identify with that masculine journey. Interestingly enough, a lot of females identify with the masculine Mm -hmm. journey. uh, And I, I increasingly in our culture, in fact, probably since the 80s, there's been this very interesting uh, experience. And today my kids would say there's far more fluidity between these archetypes moving in and out. Mm. So I'm curious to see how that story develops. I can only talk about maybe traditional stories or stories that have been passed down to us from, from even pre-civilizational years. I don't know. I tend to think that, that while we have invented, uh, bigger and flatter TVs that we may not have changed quite <laughs> as much as we think, um, yeah. even though certainly technology has shifted so many things, but I suspect these ancient archetypes are still moving on us and affecting us. And, uh, and we do well to notice them. Yeah. I mean, that resonates with me certainly. And, uh, I know it resonates with a lot of the men I know. Um, I want to be respectful of your time because I know we're coming up to an hour here. Um, there are going to be people uh, there are already tons of people that, uh, that I know that are interested in your work and, um, listen to your podcast. Um, they're going to be new people that want to, uh, find out how they can learn more about you, what you do, um, be a part of your movement. I know that you work with people one-on-one. You also have gatherings and whatnot. Um, what's the best way for people to find out more about you, to find out about the work that you do? Yeah. Well, go over to Instagram. That's sort of the haunt that I, 
that I uh, land in. Uh, so Instagram, and you can find me at Rainier Wild there. Um, my website, rainierwild.com, will also sort of get you to a number of things. You know, I, I don't work a lot with people one-on-one. I pour a lot of myself into those moments. So I've, I've sort of limited the degree to mm-hmm. which I, I end up teaching people one-on-one. Um, and I do those cyclically. Obviously, I have the, the rope, which we talked about earlier, beautiful uh, uh, quarterly men's gathering that's in full-fledged form right now if men are interested in participating in the next one that starts in May. Um, they can get on the wait list now. Um, additionally, yeah, working, hopefully live gatherings will begin soon enough. That would be wonderful. And, uh, Uh, I am actually releasing an independent self-study course called the path, um, coming up. And so they can get on the wait list and and that's really all about self mastery. And so Uh many of the concepts that we've talked about, um, are kind of explored there in a self-guided technology of change. So I'm really excited about that as well. We've put a lot into that and they can find out more. Most of that information is there on Instagram. And and that really is the easiest way to, to follow my work. I write rather prodigiously and, and so Mm. they'll find all of that there. Mm. Love it. Well, I'll definitely be signing up to the wait list for that. Um, Can't wait for that. The last question I'd like to ask you is, um, it kind of has to do with, uh, the idea of this, the, the mass that we interact with, right? People know me, d- different people know me in different ser- ser- uh, situations, just as I'm sure people know you in different situations, your friend, family know you in a different way than, uh, than I know you, for instance. Um, we're often misunderstood. So when you think about how people perceive you through Instagram or through your website, through the work that you've done, how are you often misunderstood and what do you wish that more people knew about you and the work that you do? Such a great question. Um, I was listening to a, a song by, um, by Brandy Carlisle called the story. Brandy Carlisle is a singer here from the Pacific Northwest and Mm-hmm. It's the, the song, the story is a real love story. I mean, it's, it's really, really beautiful. And there's this line in it that she says, and I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't quote it. She says, um, all of these lines across my face tell you the story of who I am. So many stories of where I've been and how I got to where I am. And, and, and then she says this, she says, um, you see the smile that's on my mouth. It's hiding the words that don't come out. And all of my friends who think I'm blessed, they don't know my head is a mess. No, they don't know who I really am. And they don't know what I've been through like you do. And I think that the reality, most of us see people who, whose lives are working to any degree that we imagine they work. Mm. And, and we, we go, oh, oh, wow, he's really got some things figured out. And perhaps, perhaps that's true. But most of us that I know, and certainly myself included, are just a mess. We're just, (laughs) we're living this beautiful human existence. Mm. You know, one of my favorite teachers said something that correlates with this. He said, before I was enlightened, I was depressed. After I was enlightened, I was still depressed. Um, And I I think that's an important statement that resonates with me. Mm. uh, Mm. Because... In so many ways, I still struggle to be a lover. I still struggle to be a father. I still struggle to, to be a friend. And these are the things that matter more and more and more to me. The work is interesting. The work is great, I'm sure. But, but the reality is, and what's most important is, how am I showing up in relationships? Oh, sure. It's like strangers can think things. And whether they think you're awful or whether they think you're fantastic, a lot of that's just on them. Um, but the reality is, who do you know yourself to be? So if I had to say, like, uh, what people misunderstand about me, it would simply be this. If there's any wisdom, if there's any insight, if there's anything here, it's because I've failed. I continue to fail. And I'm simply living the human experience in all of its fullness, all of its joys, and in fact, its sorrows. And, uh, 
I think that's just an important thing to note. That is beautiful. And I couldn't uh, ask for a better note to end on. So Rainier, I appreciate you, appreciate your podcast and all the wisdom that you share. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And uh, I look forward to seeing all the content uh, that you put on your podcast in the future. Thanks so much, Taylor. It was a real honor to be here. Yeah. Thank you again for checking out this episode of the Power Plant Body Podcast. If you enjoyed it, I'd be grateful if you left it a rating and review in iTunes. When you leave a rating and review, it really helps because it lets iTunes know and they'll be more likely to promote it to others who could also benefit from hearing these conversations. And feel free to share this episode with people who could also benefit from hearing Rainier's wisdom. Make sure you check out Rainier's podcast, Lost Man Standing. Remember that's lost spelled L-O-S-T. And follow Rainier Wild on Instagram. That's at Rainier Wild or at R A I. N-I-E-R-W-Y-L-D-E and head over to his website www.rainierwild.com to check out his blog because it's definitely worth a read. Don't forget to head over to powerplantbody.com forward slash free dash tools to get your hands on a free copy of the Goal Wheel PDF along with tons of other free tools and resources because I'm regularly adding new tools and resources to that page to help you create the best version of yourself so you'll definitely want to bookmark it. You can find me on Instagram at The Vegan Trainer. That's at T-H-E-V-E-G-A-N-T-R-A-I-N-E-R. I almost forgot how to spell vegan there for a second. And feel free to send me a DM if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes. Thanks again for spending some time with me and Rainier today. I'll see you in the next episode.